extremely discouraged as a missionary and uh, just having a real hard time. A friend of mine sent me a, a cassette tape. Now, most of y'all don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> People that are all like me know what a cassette tape is. <laughs> His brother Brown was preaching a message, and the title of it was There. T H E R E. He said, wherever God has placed you there, and you're there, you need to stay there. I never met the man before in my entire life, and I heard that message and, uh, from somebody I didn't even know, but it was an encouragement and a strength to me, uh, for myself especially, but for our whole family, just to keep trusting God and doing the work. And he had placed me there, and my, my only thing I need to do was just stay there until he moved me someplace else. And uh, so from about, I say it's probably about 1987, uh, we became friends. And uh, he's, he's just, he's just, a, he's just a very special, special guy. So I appreciate you praying for Miss Diane and the family. And I know the difficulty for her for their church, Victory, and uh, all that they're doing down there. Keep them in your prayers. I know they greatly appreciate it. And our nation as well. We can pray for them. Jean McDonald, I don't know if she was mentioned this morning. Uh, she has surgery this Thursday. And uh, just a lot of things going on in people's lives. We just need to be praying for each and every one. Our Father, we come to you this morning with bowed heads, humble hearts, just telling you how much we love you and thank you for salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Thanking you for the cross. Thanking you for your shed blood. Thanking you for your resurrection and your coming again to take us home. And I thank you, Father, that we can come before your throne of grace and mercy and bring our petitions before you as your children. And, uh, Father, asking you to meet the needs of these that we are praying for this morning. For Ms. Jean, I pray for her, Lord. I know that she's uh, in quarantine right now. And I ask you just to bless her. I pray for the surgeons on Thursday that you would uh, just touch their hands and guide and direct in every, every part of the surgery uh, that will be done on her. I pray, Lord, for uh, Ms. Diane and, and all the family there in North Augusta. For the church this morning, I know that uh, the CT will probably be having a difficult time today uh, knowing that uh, the preacher is not, not there, but he's in heaven. And so, Lord, I, I just pray your blessings on all that takes place. The funeral on Wednesday, I pray, Lord, you anoint this place with the blessed Holy Spirit of God. And that some lost soul in that big crowd will come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Bless our service today. Bless our choirs, they sing. And whoever sings the special this morning, dear God, anoint them. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, anoint Brother Brian and Miss Robin as they play all the different uh, parts they play in our service. God just bless us and help us to worship and praise you for who you are this morning. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Please stand and turn to 341. Victory in Jesus. 341. <laughs>
September the 11th. And that'll be 12 to 2. Marvin Phillips will be the speaker. And Mr. Mark, you will be uh, catering for lunch. Amen. And September 9th will be uh, uh, the next ladies, ladies' Day Out. We're going to, to, to Tennessee and uh, leaving here to church at 6 a.m. And then Tuesday night will be our final uh, Tuesday in August. They've all been great, amen. Amen. Looking forward to the last one being just as good, if not better. And uh, John, will be able to hear this one. No, I haven't heard So John needs to be here at 7. He'll be starting at 7 p.m. He'll be preaching. The Arms of Calvary will be singing for us on Tuesday. Any other announcements? I've got one card. God bless you. May you receive abundant blessings in return for the special way you have expressed love. Thank you for, for your cards, prayers, and flowers in the past of my sister. She's now singing in God's choir. Love, Ronnie and Amy Miller. All right. Had a birthday or anniversary this past week. Come forward this time.
says, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Our Savior's blood is so precious, so pure, it's so powerful. It only takes just one drop.
week. And uh, I don't know if it was an email that was sent to me. Now, let me just say real quick, it's not a Joel Osteen email. <laughs> I was on television. Right? Well, bless God, you just can't help yourself. That's why I don't like to be live streaming. I, I can't be myself sometimes. I say what I want to say, do what I want to do. I've been told I need to be sophisticated today. I figure that'll last about as long as I pray and it'll all be over with. Warning. There is no vaccination against death. If you haven't settled the issue of eternal salvation, you need to get saved by faith in Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. Then you can trust Christ to hold your life in his good hands. Elderly people in particular must be ready to die of something. And at the end of the day, something will break through and get you. And no vaccine, Pfizer, Johnson, Johnson, or any of others can save your life. It don't matter how many types of vaccine you get, when God gets ready to take you home, He's just going to take you home. And uh, we just need to be trusting Him and uh, remembering that God's still in control of everything that's going on. Please stand with me if you would, please, as we read God's precious word. They were singing that song. Choir was, and I was thinking about the preacher. That's what I always called him, preacher. And uh, I got to thinking, I said, I bet he's, I, well, ever since I was thinking, I bet he's running all over everybody. <laughs> I bet he's done skidder in the home plate on the streets of government. You say, you believe that preacher? No. I'll tell you where he is. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday morning, God took him home. He went to the feet of Jesus. Amen. He thanked that good God that saved him. Yeah. From all the wickedness that he was living a wicked, ungodly life. God saved him out of that day. And then, of course, you, you all know the rest of his life. But I'm telling you, he's, uh, I know he's rejoicing Amen. in the presence of his Savior. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked, perverse, and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. There he's talking about Christians shining as lights in the world. He says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored, Vain. Our Father, we love you this morning. We're so thankful for the good songs that we've sung, have sung to us. We're thankful, Lord, for that uh, precious drop of blood that saved my wretched soul. And I know many others that are in here this morning. Father, our, our, our most earnest prayer today is that if somebody's walked in this building that's not saved, they'll come and trust Christ as their personal Savior. Let us take the precious word of God and show them how to know him in a personal way. Then, Lord, I pray for every Christian this building. We need to be encouraged. And uh, I pray, God, that the blessed Holy Spirit will do that encouraging in our hearts and lives as we listen to thy precious word and glean on what you have for us this morning. So, Lord, God, help me. I ask once again, as I always do, for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit's power. That he move across this building and speak to hearts and touch and change lives today as he only, only he can do. I'll thank you and praise you for it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. I'm basically going to start out because uh, the, sermon, the sermon is, is the other half of the one that I started last week. So I'm going to give you the same introduction. And that will help you remember what we looked at before. We, uh, we, how we stand says a lot about our convictions. And I, and I believe that with all my heart. How we stand. And I'm not, I'm not talking about in the church, but outside the church. 
And the reason we have so many Christians that are just kind of wishy-washy today is because they have no convictions about the Bible. They have no convictions in their lives. And uh, they don't have any convictions about doctrines. They don't have convictions about salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. They don't have any conviction about the blood atonement. I'm going to tell you something. If we didn't have the blood atonement, ain't none of us going to heaven. I'm going to tell you that right now. And they don't have any conviction about it. They don't want to talk about the blood. That's Listen, that's just, you just don't talk about stuff like that. Well, I do. I'm glad Charlie sang about this morning because that helped me. And uh, I needed just a little bit of encouragement about what I was going to say to you. And the Holy Spirit says, just tell them about the blood, son. They'll all understand what you're talking about. And I'm glad that I believe the doctrine of the atonement for sin through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That there's no other way to get to heaven. Amen. I know we're hearing all kinds of stuff today, but I'm going to tell you something. God has not changed. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. And God has not changed the way of leaving this place saved by grace and getting to heaven. There's not another new way. There's only one way. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So I'm glad that I met him a long time ago. I'm glad that I have settled my salvation in 1970 by the grace of God, washing the blood of the Lamb, and all my way to heaven. And brother, I've been on my way for a long time. I've enjoyed the trip. Not all of it, but most of it. But I'll tell you something, we, we, uh, God, I believe, is calling for us and asking us to take a stand, and uh, a strong stand, to live holy lives. Go with me to the book of 1 Peter for just a moment. Be consistent. You can't, one man said this, you can't be a strong Christian today if you don't have some strong convictions in your life. I think the Word of God is clear that consistency in holiness. Now I know that's a word people don't like to hear a lot, but that's okay. It's in the Bible. So if it's in the Bible, it's okay to say it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. I'm glad you're all with me this morning. Convictions. And, I, and have consistency in holiness and service. Let me tell you something. God says those are not an option. Those are things that He expects you and I to do. He expects us to seek to live a holy, godly Christian life. I mean, I need to say that one more time. I'm in the middle this morning. I may have to go to each side. That's what I believe God expects us to do is to live a holy Christian life. Not only that, I think he expects us to serve him. And those are not options. We didn't get saved to sit down. We got saved to serve. And I believe that's what God wants for us. Look at 1 Peter 13, chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And, and mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And God is a holy God. He expects his children to to be holy people and holy children of God. I know we're not perfect, and I understand that, but I'm going to tell you something. Just because we're not perfect doesn't mean that we don't have to try to seek to be holy. What was it the Apostle Paul said? I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that, to me, is not only what he's pressing to do for God, but pressing us to be a holy child of his. And I think it's so important Verse 14, I want you to notice when they go back to Philippians real quick. And look at verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That talks about submission. That talks about complying. And that's talking about what you and I are supposed to do as children of God. We are to be submissive to Him. We're to act like, a, we're to have a Christ-like manner. That's how we ought to act. I've been Christians all the time, and it surprises me when they tell me they've been saved by the grace of God and they're a child of the King because of the manner in which they live and the way they talk, all these other different things in their lives are not Christ-like things. I, I believe with all my heart, you and I need to be as Christ-like as we possibly can. Amen. And the closer we get to God, the more holy we'll be Amen. for our Savior. Jesus is a personification 
personification of all these words. When he left the throne of God and, and stooped to be to the form of a servant, can I tell you something? He did not complain. How many of y'all ever had somebody ask you to do something and the first thing you do, <laughs> you're already complaining. You don't want to do it. But you don't know how to tell them you don't want to do it. But eventually, you'll complain, you'll murmur, you'll moan, you'll groan, you'll do everything in the world to try not to do what's been asked of you. I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad that when God said, Son, it's time now for you to be born out of a virgin, I'm going to have the blessed Holy Ghost and plant you into the womb of Mary, I, and it's going to take place on this day. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son yeah. to be made a woman. Yeah. Hey, listen, God has the perfect timetable. He's got a he's got a perfect book, and God looked down in his book and he said, Son, it's time. We're in that time now where you need to go. It's time for you to be born. It's time for you to be reared in obscurity. It's time for you to make yourself known at the age of 30. It's time for you to go and do all these different things. And then it's time for you to die. All of this is going to take place. I just want you to know where you're headed. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he say? He's praying. The Bible says his old sweat drops of blood run blood. And he said, Father, if, it, if thou be willing. He's asking for God's will. If it's your will, remove this cup that I'm looking into right now of all the wickedness that has ever been wicked, all the sins that have ever been sinned, everything the devil has done, I'm looking into this that he has put on your children. I'm looking into this that he has put on the whole world and I'm going to die for their sin. If you be willing... Let this cup pass for me. But I'm glad it says, but nevertheless, I like that little word, but, yeah. but nevertheless, thy will be done. Yeah. And he went to Calvary. Yeah. He, he didn't tell him, Lord, I, Father, listen, I'm sweating blood and everything else here. Don't, isn't that enough? Yeah, I, I mean, I wore, I wore myself out hanging on this rock right here sweating and talking to you. God said, no, son. You got to go to Pilate. They're coming to get you. They're going to go to Pilate's judgment hall, and all this stuff's going to take place. And then you're going to Calvary, and you're going to die. You're going to be nailed to an old rugged cross. You're going to be nailed to a tree that I planted years ago. You're going to be nailed with some iron nails that uh, I put the iron in the earth for them to dig out and make. You're going to die on our creation. Because you're dying to the greatest creation I ever created. And that was man. Yeah. He said man's sin has to be paid for and you are the one that's paying for it. And that's exactly what he did for us. And I, you know what? I, I, I don't think, I, I think that when you look at what he all he did for us, it's the least we can do is do for him. Serve him. Thank God he saved me. I'm glad he saved me. I'm glad he called me into the ministry. I, I, I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want to be anything else. But when God laid it on my heart to do those things, I just did what he put on my heart to do. And that's to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry said about mumbling and grumbling. He said so that so many people practice. Do all things. Do your duty in every branch of it. Without murmuring, do it and do not find fault with it. Mind your work. Do not quarrel with it. God's commands were given, notice this, to be obeyed and not to be disputed. We, we don't look in the Bible when God begins to speak to our hearts and say, well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you. Well, God, let me just tell you what I think about that. Can I tell you something? He don't care what you think about. He put it in there not for you to dispute or argue with him about it. He put it in there because he expects you to do it. It's a command from him. Amen. He said, go to all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. And some people say, well, that's not for me. That's for the preacher. And that's for this one. And that's for this one. That, that doesn't pertain to me. 
I find it amazing that you don't see in that verse of scripture in the Gospel of Matthew where he designates certain people. He said, go ye. How many is that? <laughs> We're all to go into the world and preach the gospel. The problem many Christians have is not obeying God's commands or disputing them or arguing with the Lord. That's the problem most of them have. Let me go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I want to show you something. I, I want to take an illustration from the Bible and show you what happens when people murmur and dispute and complain. I'm talking about God's children. Now, I don't know whether you're murmuring, disputing, complaining. I have no idea. I just want to tell you what happens when you murmur and dispute and complain to God. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Look with me at verse number 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. He's talking about the Old Testament. Paul's using this illustration. But if you go back and look, you'll see what he's talking about. He says in verse number one, more brethren, I would that you not be ignorant, should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He said, I want you to be ignorant. Verse 10, neither murmur, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Say, preacher, what is he talking about? I'm glad you asked. Turn the book of Numbers. Look at Numbers chapter 21. Look at verse number 5. Now, you know, they've been on a journey for a long time. They're a little bit upset about, you know, they came, they, they just, the Israelites are mad. And the people, verse number 5, chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Notice that. They spake against God first and then against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They don't like, they're saying, we don't like this manna that we're eating right now. So we're tired of it. We've been eating on it day after day after day, and we're tired of it. Notice what verse 6 said. This is how quick God reacts. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they did bite the people, and much people of Israel died. You know, it would be better off if they just jumped Moses. But they jumped God first. That was a bad mistake. Don't ever take your murmurings and your complainings and all the other things and start blaming God for it. There are a lot of people that shake their fists in the face of God. I wouldn't even dare think about doing something right. that idiotic. Right. Right. God's not in, the, in, the, in that kind of... Look, go with these. Let's turn back over to uh, chapter number 16 in the book of Numbers. I want to give you these sayings. I, I don't know if we'll finish here this morning or not, but I, I want to give you these because I want you to understand what the Apostle Paul is trying to teach the Philippian church. This, this was a church... That was his crown of rejoicing. This is the church that was his joy. And he talked about joy all the time. Well, let me tell you something. You can have a great, wonderful, joyous church and still have murmuring and complaining and disputing it. And so, if you know the two women that were having a problem in chapter number four, when he corrects both of them, let me tell you something. God, it doesn't matter. Oh, listen, the devil's going to conjure up anything and everything he can try to destroy our testimony and our work here in this church, but not just in the church, but in our individual lives. He doesn't want us doing things for God. He doesn't want us reaching out and telling people about the Lord Jesus. Look with me in Numbers chapter 16, and look with me in verse number 1. Now Korah, the son of Azhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Edrim, the son of Elab, and, and On, the son of Peleth, Sons of Reuben took men. Notice this. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. These were some of the top dogs in Israel. Probably, I don't even try to figure out what they were. And they gathered themselves together against Moses 
and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you. See, all the congregation are holy. Now, these guys have made a statement that's a lie. They said all the congregation is holy. Let me tell you something. Not all that congregation was holy. You say, hey, know that preacher, because these, these right here are stepping up and being unholy with what they're asking. You said uh, all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. So now they're saying Moses lifted himself up like he is he, he is uh, their uh, answer to everything. And Moses had none that. And notice how Moses' reaction. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Why did he do that? And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even to Mark, the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who hath, who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. So here's a test that's fixing to take place. And, and so if you look with me, I'll give you just a couple of other things. Uh, it talks about uh, Korah, Nathan, and Abram, and all these people that had gathered against Moses. They were really trying to assert the authority of God's man at that time with what they were trying to do. And it says in verse number uh, verse number 30, all these things have happened, then, then it says, Moses says, but if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, with all, the, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then shall ye understand, then shall, then ye shall understand that there is, these men have provoked the Lord. What they were doing, they had, they brought these 250 princes in, what they did, they went in and offered incense unto the Lord. They had no business being in there. That was the only place for the Levites and the priests. And these guys decided they were going to go in and do it themselves. Came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words in the ground, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the old earth opened her mouth, swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained to Korah, and all their goods. And they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. I want you to notice this. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Let's, or, Lest the earth swallow us up also. I want you to notice verse 35. The Lord didn't forget about them 250. They didn't go down in the crack of the earth. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. They went into a place of holiness, and they were not holy. They went into a place where they had no business going into, and God punished them for going in there. 250 of them he killed right there. That's basically what, what he did. And then, of course, verse 40 says, This is to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, let no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and as his company, as the Lord said unto him by the hand of Moses. Now he's already told him, he said, listen, you don't let any strangers come in here and begin to offer incense because they're going to be just like Korah and all his buddies. They'll either go down in the earth or I'll zap them with a streak of light and a fire. God says you don't do those things. And I'm going to tell you something. The only thing Korah was doing was murmuring. He was mad because... He wanted to be a part of what was going on, and he was trying to get Moses to start to add, you know, allocate different things so they could help him out. They weren't called to help him out. They asked, they called themselves to go and do what they were wanting to do. God didn't have a hand in it at all until the earth opened up. Let me tell you something. I, the, one, of the, one of the saddest things is that all that mumbling and everything get up, got them in all kinds of trouble. I'm going to tell you something. Murmuring and complaining will not bring God's blessing. But it will, however, bring His judgment as it did on them. Disputing is an open discussion of faith. A little whispering will always lead to bigger problems. Deadly explosions of debate often start with a smaller secret whispering. Murmuring start as a secret in your heart. 
It soon becomes public as it is manifest in the disputing and debates. Listen, let me tell you something. Things will manifest in your heart, and it will finally get to the place where it goes and goes and goes, <clears throat> and finally it will come out. This thing will open up. You can't hold all that inside of you without letting it go. That's why I tell you that the best thing for us to do is learn to praise and worship God. No matter where we're at. And uh, just be happy. I, I'm, I'm happy because I know one day I'm going to heaven. So they don't need to be sad, mad, glad, nothing else. I'm just happy. I sing that little song, Happy Am I, Jesus is mine forever. Amen. Second part says never to leave. Never to leave. He's mine forever. I, you know what? I, I ask people, when I talk to people, I, I ask them that kind of questions like that all the time. And yet many of them have no answer for it. Well, I'm hoping I'm getting there. I'm not hoping. My hopes are already been taken care of. I hope the songwriter wrote, I hope to build on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. All Christ the solid rock, God's man, all of the ground sinking sand. Amen. My house is built upon the rock. I was building on the sand until I got saved by grace, and he took me out of the sand and put my feet upon the rock. And then he established, as the psalmist said, my goals. I'm glad God's, I, I, I'm going to say he's in charge, but I sometimes like to take charge myself. Amen. You do too. I know you do. You can't. We're to follow and serve the Lord in humility and sacrifice. There'll be no place for murmuring and no place for disputing in our lives. When God Almighty, through the blessed Holy Ghost, begins to deal with your heart about doing something, you have no reason, you have no reason whatsoever to reject or argue with God about what He's calling you to do. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, because when you do that, that's exactly what He will have you do eventually somewhere down the road. You say, how do you know that, preacher? I am a prime example. God called me to preach and my wife will verify this. I surrendered to preach the gospel. I, I did not that I went forward to church and surrendered and told the Lord. I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to. That was a lie. I'll do anything you want me to. That was a lie. I'll preach the gospel anywhere you want me to preach it. That was a lie. And then I said, but I will not be a missionary. <laughs> Open mouth, insert both feet. <laughs> he said, no, you won't be one now, but you eventually will. It won't be long. <laughs> and at a missions conference in my church where I was pastoring, and the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart. In fact, the man that was preaching, he's already in heaven now, bless his heart. He told me, he said, John, there's somebody in this church God's dealing with. I said, yeah, I know it is. Uh, well, duh, you know I said, I hope they make things right with God tonight. He said, I do too. <laughs> so I, I told him, I said, do you have any kind of, do you feel like who it is or who it might be? He said, well, no. He said, I just feel like God's dealing with somebody. I don't know who it is, but he's, he's definitely dealing with somebody. He said, let's pray for him right now. I want to save him. <laughs> we'll save him for later. <coughs> and Dr. Norwood begins praying, and he said, Lord, I don't know who that is. It needs to surrender and submit to your will. They all come tonight. Amen. That's about the size of them. I felt embarrassed going. That night, sitting on the front pew of my church, I bowed my head. The first thing I did was ask God to forgive me not being 100% submitted to him. Mm -hmm. There at that moment, I told the Lord, I said, God, whatever you want to do to me, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll go to the mission field. I, I, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Right there that night, sitting in my own church, I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ to do what he wanted to do, not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, we went to England. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> so let me tell you,
tell you something, don't murmur against God if he's calling you to do something. Just remember what the preacher said. He'll get the job done. He'll, he'll get you motivated to go where he wants you to go and do what he wants you to do. That's just the way God is. You know why he does that? Because he loves us. He loves us immensely. All he's done for us, can't we just serve him without murmuring and disputing him? All the Father commands us, verse number 15, herein lies a great responsibility of having a shining testimony. And I talk about that all the time. I, I believe with all my heart, wherever we go, we ought to shine as the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to shine as one of his children and, and letting the world know that he has saved us by his grace. I, I, I'll tell you something. God have mercy on the Christian who lives in such a way to give ammunition to the devil. Do I need to say that one more time, or do y'all understand what I'm saying? God have mercy on the child of God who lives a life that gives ammunition to the devil to try to destroy what Jesus Christ is in other people's lives. We ought not listen. We ought not load his cannons up. We ought to blow his cannons up. We ought not allow him to have a foothold in our lives. We're, we're saved by grace. We're going to heaven. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But let me tell you something. He has not given up on doing everything he can to destroy the child of God's testimony. He can't take me to hell, I believe. But I'll tell you what. He'll do anything he can to destroy your testimony and mine. And when he can destroy the testimony of one of God's children... He's got him some ammunition. So somebody's going to say, well, what happened to so-and-so? And the devil's going to be right there. And they're going to say, well, he, he or she, they decided that they made a mistake and they just let the devil have control and now he's using them and using their testimony as, as a sorry Christian. I don't want to be called a sorry Christian. I'm sorry enough as it is. I was a sorry, low-down sinner until Christ saved me. Amen. 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 I, 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 listen, I don't want that in my life. So I'm sure I'm, I'm not as perfect as some of you all are. <laughs> we be, need to be blameless and not all that harmless. Harmless means unmixed. It refers to the absence of any foreign substance. A Christian is to live a separated life. Second Corinthians says, Come out from among you, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, saith the Lord. God tells us to be separated from those things. When our testimony for Christ becomes mixed and tainted with the pollution of the world, our light dims. Our testimony becomes one of hypocrisy before this crooked and perverse world that we live in. I don't want to be called a hypocrite. I'll say it one more time. I don't want to be called a hypocrite. Amen. I, I remember my dad used to say all the time when we had tried to get him to go to church, he said, well, none of us saved. He said, I ain't going to that church. That church is full of hypocrites. If I'd have been saved then. You know what I said? I said, well, come on, Dad. Let's be and you go join that bunch. <laughs> we hypocrites. We just go in there and get with the rest of that bunch. My dad, wouldn't, he wouldn't go for the longest. Then they finally moved to another church and it wasn't no better than the last church. Anyhow, I don't want to be called a hypocrite. I don't want to be labeled as a backslider. I don't want to be labeled as, well, there goes that sorry preacher and he backslid and this about this and this about that. I don't want to be labeled like that. I want to be labeled as a child of the king. Amen. I want my light to shine. I'm sure mine goes on dim every now and then. No doubt. I want you to notice this. We're the light of the world. Total darkness cannot exist where there's light. It'll always be like, you know, <coughs> darkness was over the face of the deep. And then God created what? Light. Wonderful well, no darkness. Once we're successful in living in the Word of God. That's what it talks about in verse 16. Verse 15, then we become more successful in laboring with the Word. Verse 15 talks about our lifestyle. 
that you may be blameless. Verse 16 talks about that we're reminded of our labor. We'll not be successful without the other. We have to have both of them. Not only must we practice the Christian life, we must also proclaim it. You say, well, preacher, where does that life begin? It lends. You go back and read verses 5 through 11. And you see the sacrifice of Christ in those verses for you and me on Calvary's cross. Let me, let me ask you a very simple question. Are you in harmony or out of harmony with the Lord and with His will? Where, where are you? What, what is, where are you in your life? Are you in harmony or out of harmony? I'll read you a couple of verses and then we're going to close this. In the book of Joshua, chapter 24. God's recounting these things to Joshua. Verse 12, he talks about he sent the hornets before you, he was dragged them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with the sword, nor with thy bow. God said, I cleaned that place up for you. Verse number 13, he says, I've given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you which you built not, and you dwell in them out of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do eat, do you eat? And then he says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. Let me tell you something, it's time for Christians to put away their gods. Amen. Uh, you know, Amen. We, we all have some, some place. Sometimes those little gods that we have begin to take the place of the God that should be first in our lives. Amen. But we allow other things to get in between us because we're just so busy. Busy, busy, busy. We're like a bunch of little blooming bumblebees just buzz, 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 buzz all the time. God's not going to take the almighty fly swatter and smack your head, but <laughs> We just seem to get, and, and when we get that kind of busy in our lives, our lives get out of harmony with God. Because we're not following in His will. And it's so important. And, and I just want to ask you, are you in harmony or out of harmony with the will of God? Verse 15 says this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Joshua said, I'm not serving that bunch that the Amorites worship. I'm not serving that bunch that our fathers worshiped on the other side. I'm not serving any of that kind of stuff. Me and my <laughs> house are going to serve God. God saved us. Let me tell you something. I, since, that happened, I, since God saved me and and Gwen, which you going to say before I did, and our kids got saved, and God called us into ministry, I've tried to do everything that I can to have our house serve the Lord. It's not always been perfect, but I tell you something, bless God, I, I tried, we tried, and did the best we could to get our kids to learn to serve the Lord. And it's important. As for me and my house, I don't, and listen, just because my children have gotten married, Glory to God, hallelujah, praise Jesus. <laughs> I still, with my wife, seek to serve the Lord as best we can. That didn't stop when I got everything out of my house. <laughs> and, uh, Gwen and I became, like some of you all have, empty nesters. No more little birds anywhere around. Everything was good. <laughs> My wife's the one cries about it all the time. She cries, I shout. <laughs> Look what he says in verse number 16. God forbid that the people answered and said, they're answering Joshua now. God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve the then he goes on and recounts the fact that he's the one that they begin to say, 
He is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. He's the Lord that instituted the Passover. He's the one that told us all these things. He's the one that's led us through all of this. And now we've come out of the wilderness and Joshua's leading us. And he's led us all these days. And God's been in charge of everything. Amen. We just need to realize, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And like the rest of them said, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to serve God. We want to serve him. Because, listen, if you ever want to see God's punishment, read the Old Testament and look at Israel. As many times they got whipped, I don't understand why they kept getting whipped. I think they just enjoyed it or something. <laughs> Every time God blessed them, He gave them manna. You heard me talking about the, the, the light bread. We loathe this stuff. We hate this stuff. Then God gave them quail. I ain't never ate no quail, but they say it's pretty good. Yeah. Some of the guys said amen. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted meat, so God gave them quail. And they said, well, we're thirsty. So God gave them water out of a rock. And all the water they could drink. And they still murmured and complained. I think about the blessings of God on them. How in the world can you complain? Ladies, let me just give this to you. How, how in the world can you complain by having one pair of shoes that never wears out for 40 years? <laughs> Hello? I, I figured every man in the church would have shouted glory to God because you know you'd have had some extra to spend. <laughs> Tammy and him used to come to our house and we lived in Chattanooga. She had two suitcases. One with clothes and one with shoes. The one with shoes was bigger than the one with clothes. <laughs>
this morning, let's take a Bible and show you how to know Christ your personal Savior. I have somebody be glad to take a Bible and show me. We're going to sing that song, Search Me, O oh God. <coughs> if you need to come this morning, you leave your place and come. You Christians pray for this morning, raise your hand that they'll leave their place and come and let's take the Bible and show them how to know Christ is their personal Savior. as we stand this morning. Sing for just a moment. Search me, O God.